Hi everyone, Dom Femular here, and thanks so much for joining us back here at Vader, having a great, great time bringing to you stories from the road. We have had an incredible amount of artists in this segment on Tuesdays at two o'clock that has been exciting from players, all areas. Cheryl Crow had joined us. We had so many, many great, great stories. And today, another special event because we have got three absolutely dedicated probably crazy guys in what they do in their lives as far as being techs some of the greatest bands literally in the world so i want to bring to you some great great players we're going to start first with tim soya soya which is see if we can bring up a, a flyer pen tim take this out man tim's been touring as a tech since the late 1980s getting a start with primus and he's worked consistently with them ever since he's toured with oysterhead cheryl crow White stick, as well as the past few years with Roger Waters. He's also the drummer with the punk rock band Victims Family. Please welcome Sawyer. Bring it on, man. Where is he? <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> how you doing, Don? Thank you. I am doing fantastic. Thanks so much, man. Now yeah. I want to bring on the next victim. We're going to bring on the next victim. Are you ready? Mike, this is fantastic. Ledemso, we're going to bring on Mike now. Mike's been, he's out there on the road with Kenny Loggins, Paul Anka, Natasha Bedfield, uh, Beddingfield, Pat Benatar, G Love, Special Sauce. He spent the last few years with Cindy Blackman Santana. Please welcome Mikey. Come on, come on in here. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, there he is, Mikey. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining us today. I got one more I want to bring in here. This is incredible. McGree, McGee is another guy absolutely special in his skill base and his talent. My gosh, he toured with some heavy names. Steve I, Dream Theater, Stone Temple Pilots, Josh Groban, David Lee Roth, Seven Dust, Meatloaf, Extreme, and many, many more. The past 15 plus years, rock legends, Aerosmith. My gosh, he's been a drum tech as well as a personal assistant. Would you please welcome McGee? Bring him on in here. Hey, gentlemen. <laughs> McGee, thanks so much for joining us. You know, guys, thanks, Tom. you guys really have been involved, you know, behind the scenes of the thick of it at literally some of the greatest concerts that this world has seen. So for that and for your efforts, I first thank you so much for your effort, man, because you guys really work hard. <laughs> oh, thank you. You, you really do. You guys, you guys are the, the backbone of putting these shows on. So I want to start. Let's start with... With Tim, Tim, give me a rundown of what got you involved in this area of touring and teching, and how did it all begin for you? Well, you know, back in in high school era, you know, when you're at that formidable age and you get into something, you, you go go full on. And I was into music and drumming, <clears throat> and uh, as I started going to shows and seeing shows, I realized uh, it was you could get to see these bands for free if you helped them out, you know. Hmm. And so I started, uh, you know, kind of helping out bands like the Mentors and Laws Rocket, but not even not hired, just got my foot in the door. And it turned into the, my punk band Victims Family as a roadie and then Primus as a roadie when they were just a little band. And it just built from there, you know, just wanting to be close to the music I loved to see was what really inspired me to want to help these bands out because I wasn't the drummer, but I wanted to be that close, you know, and this goes from there, you know. One band to the next, you just start climbing the ladder if you know what you're doing and you do a good job, you know? Well, part of doing that good job, and, and which I want to hit more of, is the fact that you got to really learn, you got to know the gear, you've got to know what each artist wants, you've got to really kind of be on top of all that, which I want to get to in a moment. Mikey, what it was like for you? What got you involved? What, what got you started? Well, I grew up in the industry. My dad's a lighting designer for live shows. And so being around it and seeing that, uh, you know, you could actually have a gig and not be like the weirdo following the band around in your van. Um, and then I started working locally here on the Nevada side uh, at a casino, uh, at a showroom as a stagehand, just doing all the things. And then kind of uh, use that and those skills and my connection to get in and kind of, my dad got me a gig and it's like sink or swim. And that was, 16 years ago so so, I think that's all right. 
when you say, you know, hopping in the van and following the band around, that, that might not be that good. So what you're saying is I should get rid of the van then, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get it for sure. <laughs> Mickey, how'd you get involved in this crazy world? Uh, speaking of vans, I think that helped get me my first gig because I met my best friend, a local drummer, and he had a local band and I had a van. So I kind of became the uh, super roadie. Nice. And he started uh, taking drum lessons from Mike Mangini uh, in the mid 90s. And Mike uh, got the gig with Steve Vai and he needed a drum kit driven out to uh, Rochester, New York and asked me to do it. And I worked out there for the week helping those guys and uh, they they liked the way I worked. I admit I was pretty green, but I think uh, my humor got me the gig before anything. <laughs> and they asked me if I wanted to do a world tour. And so I did, did a year with Steve Vai and then literally two days after I did another year with Dream Theater. So I did kind of back to back big kits and here we are now. <laughs> Well, this this sounds like to a certain degree baptism by fire. You were thrown into this thing pretty hard, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I look back on them days. It's some of the hardest I've ever worked. You know, I think sometimes as you climb the chain with bands, uh, backline guys, we don't have it as rough as lighting guys, you know, and sound guys. They're the first ones in, last ones out. We kind of have to wait for the stage to get set up and everything. But But we still have a lot of pressure on us because you don't want a drum kit falling apart or something not sounding right, you know? So is there is there research you have to do on their kit and parts? And, you know, how much, how much you know, back work do you have to do to prepare yourself? Um, when I Whenever I get a new gig, I try to get as many pitches as I can. Uh, usually the drummer would help you set up the first time. And I label the heck out of everything, you know? I have a system which these guys probably have their own system too, as far as what goes where, what you, you know, you kind of foolproof it, idiot proof it. And like these guys, you know, you have to kind of get in the drummer's head and start thinking like, oh, what could he want next? You know, what, what if this breaks, how am I going to fix that? And we've all had to go out there and fix something during a live show. And it's not always fun. It's not, not good to be seen out there, but, but stuff happens, you know? So what's what's like a typical day? You know, let, let, let's start with, with Tim. A typical day, man. You you know, you get you get the tour information. Do you talk to the drummer and find out what they need? How what, what's what, what's well? The, usually, what what happens is you rehearse a little bit, and once the tour gets rolling, it, it's it's basically it's up to you to get in there and get it all set up, and the and to make sure the drummer doesn't have to think about anything like that. You know, so. You just, you know, your drum kit, you've got your finger on the pulse of every piece of, of everything about it. You know, one day at the end of the show, as you're taking it down, you'll, you'll feel something's loose and you'll know the next day you go in and you get everything out, set it up, line check, everything works, you know, get some lunch and then the band will show up for sound check and you can go over stuff mm -hmm. the drummer artist could say, I want the symbol a little bit more like this, you know, or whatever, get through little stuff like that and then just do the gig, you know? And then tear it down. It's. I mean, the the longer I've done this, the less problems I have on stage because of so many times in the old days of you know you didn't tighten something correctly and you just get this Zen routine to get everything tight, man. You know, I mean, McGee, you would probably know too. You know, you get on these big gigs, you don't want to go out on that stage, or you're not even allowed on the stage. You know, you got to make sure that everything does not fail. You know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so. And I'm sure there's different kinds of sets you have to work with. Yeah. You know, Mike, what's that? What's it like for you? What, what, what's the routine that you would you'd get into? Well, just like uh, Tim was saying, kind of trying to make it so the the least amount of work every day, kind of build on that. And oh, this last show, this one issue happened. Uh, you know, a symbol got loose, so you know that one. The next day, you crank that one down and never an issue again and you keep doing the same thing all the time you know if the, the issue with me in my uh history is dealing with vintage drums on the road so it's just just prepare for stuff to be broke every day <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah how crazy so 
McGee, when you're working on a set like with Steve Vai and Mike Mangini, listen, Mike Mangini, it would be a heck of a lot easier if they asked you to design and build a battleship <laughs> than Mike Mangini said. What, what's it like with a setup like that? Well, Mike's current kit is crazier than the one I used to do. When, when I started with him, he had the Rototom kit, and, and I loved that kit. You know, I thought it was a pretty cool kit, but uh, I don't know. When these guys have the monster kits, Again, you just you kind of develop your own system. And I'm one of those guys, you know, that I don't really like stagehands. Uh, they'll always assign you one, but I'll have them kind of stand by and watch, open a case, you know, just so they're not hauling, uh, you know, cable or moving trusses. Like they kind of have an easy day when they work for me. But, you know, you just like these guys said, you, you, you focus on, on the kit, make sure everything's tightened down. I, the guy, I worked for a guy, Morgan Rose from Seven Dust uh, back in 99, and he would destroy stuff. So he's really, he's really the only guy I've ever worked for that, you know, he broke three symbols at Woodstock 99 in like 15 minutes. And, <laughs> and, and he's still the only guy that's ever broken a kick drum. I don't know if these guys have experienced that, but I've, I've only had one broken kick drum during a show. Now, what do you mean by a broken kick drum is it a pedal or the head or what, what, yeah, what the, the oh. head right through the head yeah have you That's guys that, had that that happened to me once at uh midtown music in atlanta with sean pelton there it is that's me i i ran so fast to the case cut <laughs> out the center of a snare head you know cut the ring off and dove under there and taped it over the hole and got through the gig with that you know Oh wow! <laughs> and it's funny because uh, Aquarian now makes a, a stick on big giant stick on for that emergency situation where you just peel and stick and it's, it, it gets you through, you know? Oh, interesting. We had that happen one time on back. And I remember all three techs on stage, we all jumped in and pulled the kick drum out and changed the head. And Beck was like, man, it's like, I got an indie pit crew out here right now, man. And we, we got it done in like, you know, less than a minute, got a new head on the kick and stuffed it back in there. <laughs> but, nice. Those pads, man, you got to have a little pad or something. You can't do a beater right on the head, man. Just yeah, some some guys like that sound, though. Know, you know, I know it's it's a risky situation. You just got to change the head if you have to. I mean, I I don't like changing heads unless you absolutely have to, but you know, whatever. Yeah. So what happens when something like this happens? What, what, what your last minute symbol breaks? You got to get up there right away. That head breaks. Yeah. You know, how many how many snare drums head break in, in, in a gig? It depends who the player is, you know, uh, and and you kind of get the get the feel of how many shows it's going to go, you know, like with uh, God with Mike Borden from Faith No More, I did for a tour. I had he played uh, Emperor X with a dot, and I had to change it every single show. There was no way he could go a second show with that thing. You didn't take a chance, you know. I mean, we you always have a spare snare sitting there, but. When we did Oysterhead and Stuart Copeland was out there, he went through three snare heads a night. Like Stuart he would, did? He would start with a snare, and then there would be a break where he would get up and go to this big 12 by 12 riser of percussion, you know, and then they would do that. And the drum tech ran out and changed the snare, and then the head would just go when he ripped it off, you know. <laughs> he finished the, the rest of the set on the second snare, and then when they go off, for the break to the encore, he'd swap the snare again and have to go to a third head because it just, he beats the living crud out of that thing with his, you know, traditional grip snap, you know? Wow. It was trippy. Yeah. I, I, on Santana, I change heads every single day, but on Cindy's snare, that's every day. Sometimes in between on the encore, have to change the snare drum out. So we just have uh, duplicates of everything. Yeah. And uh, and then with the percussionist Carl Perazzo on that timbali, the high timbali, it's so high that the collars will snap, like on um, the heads, just the manufacturing, yeah. oh, like wow. pretty frequently. So again, it's just redundant sets. Swap it out as best you can, as fast as you can. But with Cindy, it's definitely over the last couple of years trying out different combos just to see what works a little better with everything and now we're getting almost through a whole show but sometimes carlos will play three hours so it will be a, a two two head show for sure right is that her kit rocking the uh black heads there the black dots yeah the black dots it That's she has like a tony williams setup with the three floor toms yeah and the black dots yeah nice 
Istanbul cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that, but you know, on the, on the other end of the spectrum, you'll get to drummers that don't hit hard or they don't want their heads changed. You know, I did the Beastie Boys for a bit and I was Mike D's drum tech and he absolutely positively was the lightest hitter I've ever worked for. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we did a big run and then we were going to Australia to do a festival thing. And the production manager calls me and says, Hey man, you know, we, we got Mike's endorsement info. You don't have to deal with it. Tell me how many heads you need to get through this, this run of eight shows and how many sticks. And I said, how many should I? eight? None. Don't order anything. Don't have <laughs> money. He's like, yeah, but what if something breaks? I'm like, dude, <laughs> nothing is going to break when Mike D is playing drums. I guarantee you that, man. I mean, he was a great drummer, but he just did not hit enough to wear anything out. You know, he yeah. kept wanting me to crank the snare higher and higher and higher just to get the pop. He would say, you know, all right. Nice. Well. So there, there's two ends of it. You know, Morgan Rose, like I can, I would love to be on that when stuff's breaking. That's my favorite. <laughs> oh yeah. It kept me busy. Over and cymbals are breaking and heads are breaking and spit and blood. And, and that, that was a, it. That was a Vans Warp tour too, where you did oh, well. six six shows a week, and uh, you never knew when you were going on. Yeah, you were in the parking lot. I've never done that tour. I, I vowed to never get on one of those if I could. Help I it. never wanted to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a whole different pacing of of how you have to work that. That's a much harder show. Oh yeah, because on that Warp tour, you didn't know when you were going on until like an hour before that. They would post the band lineup back then in '99. So you might look at the lineup and it'll say seven dust on at one and it's like 11 and you got to get dump a truck, get a kit set up. That was the most sunburned I've ever been in my life, man. <laughs> I know some people that have done that multiple times and I don't even know how they're still alive from <laughs> the horror stories. I hear about how drudgery that tour was, you know, the endless yeah. horror stories about everything. It's like you go on tour to get beat up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The dude who played bass with Katy Perry when I did that, he was really cool. And he was on Katy Perry when she did the Warped Tour, when the I'm Just a Girl, or not I'm Just a Girl, uh, I Kissed a Girl had, had just come out. And they were they were like dragging their equipment across parking lots to get to the third stage because that's where they got, you know, picked to play that day. Yeah. He said it was it was absolutely awful. And all of a sudden, Katy Perry's song blew up. And they just left the tour. And all of a sudden, we're playing arenas, you know, like. The next, oh, that, the next day, you know, and they were like, "Okay, cool, no more work tour, thank God." You know? <laughs> <laughs> what What's it like? Are you guys, are you a part of any of the designing of the kit? Are you there with the artists to to assist them and, and make suggestions? Totally, yeah, totally. I, I helped design that Wonka kit for Primus, and then when we did Roger Waters, me and Joey Warner, uh, we worked together to design and tune the kit that we used on the Roger Waters tour. That's the Primus kit right there. Um, wow. But Roger Waters kit was, was very unique because uh, Joey wanted to incorporate different eras of Pink Floyd into what the drum kit sounded like without changing the drum set. So uh, we had a regular two Tom, two floor front kit that was two heads. And then we had on each side uh, concert toms. And so the kit on the inside, we, we had threads of Dark Side of the Moon and all the records that he had gotten from the producer, the remaster stuff. And we go to LA, we unpack, I unpack this kit, and he comes down and he opens his computer and just starts playing like, you know, no vocals, minimal, just the drums. And you knew where you were of like Pink Floyd songs from Dark Side of the Moon, you know, and you're just like, and we tuned the kit to sound like that, like the same pitch of the toms. And then we went to the wall, same thing. And we did the outside kit that was all thuddy and rock like the wall and animals is because that was the meat of the set was those three records, you know? So, and then, you know, you get it together and it, it just worked, you know, everybody loved it. It was really cool. It's really fun to be a part of the, that integral part as opposed to just showing up and do those, this is my drums, make it sound like this, you know, and you don't have anything to say about it, you know, but. Right. Yeah. And sometimes like in rehearsal, you'll find out it's like, oh, we're doing all this stuff from this album. And it's like, well, that album had no real drums. It's like, okay, we <laughs> yeah. need an electronic kit. So on Natasha Bangfield, we had like a kind of like a Neil Peart style where it's like two kits merged into one. It was a six piece, you know, with a couple snares and tons of pads and triggers. And then you kind of rotate it and you're on to a five piece Yamaha with its own electronic symbols. 
and the, all the brains we had MIDI linked together. And so we had to figure out, I, every day it was matching the pages of these two brains all through a MIDI pedal because I'm behind them hitting the switch that's switching everything for each song, you know, for yeah. the electronic kit and, and the triggers that are on the acoustic kit. And so, you know, in rehearsal, we had to make that happen, make it up, kind of, you know, hybrid out some stuff to make it work for the sound they were going for on that album for that tour. Trippy. What kind of technology right. challenges do you have with electronic drums? Every kind. I'll, <laughs> I'll take this first because I'm a dinosaur when it comes to electronics. <laughs> I mean, I'm an acoustic drum guy mostly, but. I, I admit I'm not great with the electronics, so. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's trippy when you get thrown in that fire. You know, you show up and it's like, oh, here's the electronic stuff, and you go, oh man, really? Oh, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. nobody told me about this. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. So sometimes it's like old stuff that's outdated, and they still want to use it because they like the sounds that are in that module. And it's like, oh, can't we just sample sample this and put it in a, like a SPD pad? No, I want to hit that old pad. It's like, oh, dude, do you that? <laughs> yeah. Such a wear out sometimes, you know. I mean, other times yeah. it, you know, if dudes want all the newest stuff, it, it's okay because it's all, you know. Now you got internet, you can just get it worked out quick. But we were using uh, Emus back on Show Crow and for drum triggers on a drum cat, you know, and loops and stuff like that. And it got to the point where the Emus started not working. And when I would call Emu, the guys like. We don't fix those anymore. You, you just need to get something <laughs> else. You don't do drum anything on emus anymore. And so we, we had to switch. So before the last one broke, I, I'm not even kidding you. I took headphone out to the end of an SPD and hit record and hit it, you know, and that's how I transferred them because oh, I didn't have time to do it correctly off stems or anything like that. You know, it was like on the fly. Yeah. These things were not working. <laughs> so headphone out, record in. Okay, now you got the SPD, you play it and it worked. It worked, you know, till we can yeah. do it correctly with the producer's stems, you know. <laughs> well, if, if you have stuff that's already samples, like if someone hands you a hard drive or a flash stick, it makes it a lot easier for me yeah. to use this all the crosstalk with the triggers. And if dudes are hitting hard and everything else, it's like, oh, you got to constantly every single day change the velocities and the sensitivity yeah. and all these triggers. Man, it gets so tricky. The sounds. Hopefully they got them and they're in a pad. And even if they're in like some hoop, the old pad, they'll make it work. But it's it's actually live drum triggering or whatever. Everything's triggering each other. It's a nightmare. Yeah. It's gotten a lot better. I remember on Beck when they finally came out with that Elisis DM Pro. Do you remember that unit? Oh, yeah, yeah. The DM Pro was just, you know, a library of sounds that came with it when you bought it. And that was it. And then they came out with another version that had a PMCI whatever card you could stick in there. And it was right when they came out, we were doing the mid, starting the Midnight Vultures thing. And if you've ever heard that record, it, you know, there's like 10 zillion sounds going on in every song. And Beck was like, come on, man, we, we got to get some of these sounds on pads. We've got it's part of the song. And I was like, dude, uh, how are we going to do this? And bass player Justin JMJ was like, dude, you got to check out that new DM Pro, the new one. And so we got it. Gave the card to the producer dude, Tony Hoffer, and he brought it back to me the next day with like 50 direct stems from the record. And it was unheard of technology. You know, we, we used it in this rehearsal room and it was like, dude, any sound from the record, I can just access in the, the library of that card. And all of a sudden the sounds from the record were like anywhere on any pad at any time I wanted to throw them around where they asked for them. It was, it was phenomenal to get that, ease of technology and it's light years past that now but definitely man that that changed the game for sure that unit was fun nice so is there a formula now with electronic stuff that you feel comfortable with is there stuff that you know works better than others and is more consistent i mean spds are the, the way to go that i ever go to you know if anybody yeah. has something old i just say let's just get an spd i know how to throw anything in it any sound you want I can take it off your phone and put it in there, you know, and we can yeah. put it on a pad and loop it or whatever, you know? I mean, the, then, yeah, I, I agree. But it, it's if the dude comes with whatever they want, they're all proprietary yeah. systems, essentially. So it's like, yeah. oh, I've never even used this one. Let me look it up, you know? Right, right. It's, it's not, not like right we're, we're the Simmons brain versus the whatever, you know, 
Yamaha brain of some unit back in the old days, they, they, you couldn't mesh the samples even together, you know, like you had to make new samples for each different unit back then, you know? Yeah. So. Wow. I mean, it, it really is. You know, listen, you guys have to do some serious yeah. research. You got to, there's insane yep. hours that go into it. Let's get into the acoustic part of it where it comes into tuning. You know, what kind of tips do you have regarding tuning and how do you maintain that sound to an entire show? Uh, well, well, I think when it comes to tuning, uh, uh, to me, a drum is only going to sound so good in a small range, you know. So you can't, if you tweak it too high, it's not going to sound good. Too low, it's not going to sound good. It's going to kind of sound waffly. So I've always found you, you'll know when you hit that sweet spot. And most drummers, are, you know, they realize that. But it, But everybody, of course, has their own. You know, when I said earlier, you kind of have to think like the drummer and what sounds he likes. You kind of, once you've been at a new gig for a little while, you know what he's looking for. So uh, just tuning, just try to get a clean sound. Some guys don't like any gels on there or gaff tape. You know, I, I've put in cotton balls and floor toms before inside of them just to help kill, you know, a little bit yeah. of, of that resonance and I mean, the acoustic yeah. drums, though, McGee, I mean, you have to agree. I mean, they'd have that spot, man. And and sometimes it's not about where you tune it as much as you got to try different head selections to get the the what that certain shell needs to, to resonate that perfect sweet spot, you know? Yeah, yeah. When, uh, when I did Meatloaf uh, with John Michelli, I'd never done a so uh, Sonor kit before. Mm. You know, and he, he had a, a Sonor kit with... Uh, what is it? G twos on there for the heads, and that, that was a, that that was the easiest tuning kit that I've ever encountered. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could almost just put it on, and it was it sounded yeah. good. Yeah. So that that's a that was a great combination for that particular kit. Yeah, I had that with the first Cheryl Crow gig I did. The second drummer of the nine I did in that gig was Jim Bogus, who's now a Counting Crows drummer. He played D'Amico drums at the time. I don't know if you heard of those. It was a custom builder out in California. And he yeah. actually bought all of Bill Gibson and Craviato's steam bending gear when solid drums dissolved, right? So that's what D'Amico was making. But he was also doing Keller shell uh, ply stuff, right? Okay. So we fly down to South America was the second thing I did. And first thing with Jim. And I pulled this kit out with the Tom. And, and just straight out of the kit, I was like, whoa. Oh, I'm not even going to touch that. You know, it helped. And that, and then you know, a couple tours later, he switched to a different kit of D'Amico, and it was not even close. No yeah. matter what I did, I could not get that sweet tone that that one blue kit had. We had that one moment, you know. So it depends, man. It's it's magic in the build, it's magic in the heads, and it's magic in how you finesse the way you spin the, the rods down, you know. Yeah, and all the combinations of those, and then sometimes you know you're told I only use X heads and that's what it is yeah. so, oh okay yeah <laughs> that, big, uh, that big giant uh tim alexander kit that you saw uh when he got that kit he switched to aquarian drum heads at that time and uh we went through i think we tried six or seven different versions of an aquarian head till we found the one that sounded killer on a, a concert tom you know like you can't just put any head because you like that head on a certain drum sometimes, you know? Yeah. So, you know, you got to work with with your drum head company and say, you got to send me all for Tim. It's extreme. You know, I needed like 14 heads of six different styles, you know, and, and I had to change them every day. He was like, oh, I don't like these ones. Let's try the next one. Like, dude. Okay. Hold on. I got to go downtown and shoot in the Oompa costume. Hold on, dude. <laughs> you know? So it just, it really, you, you got to try everything. And, and, but then sometimes like, Rolling Stones, for for example, Charlie Watts doesn't change his heads ever. Yeah, never. Like his, we did some Stone shows and uh, asked the drum tech, you know, man, that that kick drum head looks old. How long has that been on there? He's like, uh, I think twenty two years, maybe. Oh yeah. What? He's like, yep, he's been playing this kit for thirty years. That head's been on there for twenty two. I'm like, what about the snare head? Oh, I think that one broke about fourteen years ago. I had to change it for the first time in a while. Yeah, <laughs> it's like. Wow. That's the that's that's the ultimate drum tech gig right there because I mean <laughs> they're top of the don't food chain. Arms, don't clean my cymbals and yeah. don't my heads. So I was like, <laughs> and, and it's a, a four piece kit. <laughs> exactly, man. Do you so, get 
do you get odd requests from drummers as far as what they want? You know, do do they say don't clean the kit, or do they say I want the kit clean? Or you know, totally. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, totally. I did I did Rod Morgenstein for a, a little while, and uh, oh, wow. he he didn't like his cymbals cleaned, and I was fine with that. But like yeah. when I do Aerosmith, Joe uh, Joe uses a lot of brilliant cymbals, mm. you know. So you got to polish them up every show, you know. Yeah, I had to polish Tommy Aldridge's cymbals every day as well. He didn't want to see fingerprints, and of course, he does cymbal catches. Oh, all yeah. Yeah. So every day I had to clean cymbals every day. And yeah. he had quite if a few. like using brilliant cymbals, they're going to be clean. And if they don't, they care a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. And then I like to say the uh, 25 years I've been touring, I've never had a stagehand clean a cymbal for me. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have, but. Uh, you know, I, I've had a couple help me on Tommy Aldridge because they were big fans and they, they wanted to, you know, touch the magic and I let them help me wipe yeah. you off. I remember on Oysterhead, I, I was in the drum tech on Oysterhead. I was Les Claypool's bass tech. And the drum tech was uh, Pete Carini, who was Fish's drum tech. You know, a lot of the Fish crew was on that because of Trey. And, you know, Stuart had a Stuart Copeland kit. You know, I mean, he had 20 cymbals on the kit. And, you know, of course, 10 splashes all over the place. And then we had the percussion kit had stuff. And he would come in, and of course, you know, everybody wanted to touch anything of Stuart Copeland, you know, because oh, of yeah. Copeland, you know, and all these union stagehands would come up, and you, you know how that goes. Oh, yeah. Just meatheads that you don't even want around you because they just try to mess everything up for you just to be funny. Who's your favorite drummer? Yeah. And so Pete Carini would, would <laughs> totally rip on these guys. It was so funny. They'd all gather around and go, okay, we're here, we're the drum tech help okay and before guys go okay you guys want to help me with the kit and they'd be like yeah 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 okay you you and you come over here open up that bag of symbols and lay all the symbols out on these trunks and then here's polish and here's some rags <laughs> check it out in an hour and, he, and they're like <laughs> what and then he'd go set up the kit without them you know while they were sitting there polishing 25 symbols you know? oh so, boy like, <laughs> this, this is an amazing amount of work to do what is it like when the opening band finishes and you've got time to get that kid out there, what's the time pressure and, and what's the intensity at that level? Depends on the venue. <laughs> yeah, it, de it depends on the tour too. Like if you, yeah. yeah, like he said, if you're playing an arena and, and if your back line and drums don't have to move, it's as simple as pulling a cover off a drum kit right on, and then doing your pre-show checklist and, and line check and all that. But if you got to hand carry out a kit quickly, you know, that, that becomes, you know, you got to trust a couple of stage hands that haven't been drinking and help get the, get the kit out. You set it up and, and finish it, you know? Yeah. Depends on the tour, man. Depends yeah. on what's going on. How many, how many bands or what, what, what time frame you have a change half hour changeover. It could be an eternity or it could be yeah running as fast as you can to try to make it work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All depends. Yeah, when we did that Wonka tour, Primus opened up for the Wonka show. So we had a mid-stage drape that hid the Wonka show. And then we put some little funny combo amps in front of the curtain that weren't even turned on. Or they were turned on, but they weren't plugged in. They played with their rigs right behind the curtain. And so I initially, I set up a third drum set because the Wonka kit was Tim's drum set. And then there was the Wonka side of it, which was another whole percussive kit. So I was setting up this kit that he would play for the opening set when Primus came out in their jeans and t-shirts, you know, and they'd play for an hour and then they'd walk off and we'd drop a downstage curtain and then quickly get everything out of the way. And then when the curtain went up, there was the Wonka show and it was just, you know, eye opening. So I was doing that at first where I would just, I would have to be going a million miles an hour to get this Tim Alexander kit off the stage. And I got it to where I could get it broken down and into the cases and get into my little Wonka stage suit not the Oompa yet, but just the yeah, uh, where a uh, costume, you know, all the crew did, and then go. And that just started wearing on me so hard because the days were so long with three kits. So yeah. I started instead, and Tim liked it a lot better. Was I would put his kit in front of the curtain, and so downstage curtain would go down, other one would go up, and I would just get a bunch of stage hands around me and say, "Dude, pick up that end, that end." It was all on pipes, and just move that kit back into position behind it, and it went like half as much time to do that you know yeah all time management on the changeovers you know you got to find your way to be able to like sit down and take a breath before the band walks out you know and not just be hustling <laughs> yeah. well, this, this is serious time management and fine-tuned effectiveness 
and the efficiency. Do you have like communication with people? Do you have like walkie talkies? Are you talking to other people? Is there a, a are there ways to communicate easier? I think it depends on the tour. Also, sometimes um, everyone has radios. Sometimes no one has radios. Sometimes. Um, Backline guys aren't allowed radios. <laughs> I, I hate, I hate yeah, radios. Yeah, that tour. What well, tour is that? All kinds. That's how it's on Santana. No backline, no radios. I since I've been around, that's changed. But pretty much is I was the only one responsible enough. But then it's like a curse too, you know. Was that a stubby call or a? Yes. Call? <laughs> I know stubby. Yeah, Dom. We call them electronic leashes. No, <laughs> nobody wants to be a. Yeah. Most people don't want a radio. I would put my radio down somewhere for the day and forget about it. And yeah, nobody, nobody ever called me on that thing, anyways. I'll yeah, because the, I just left it on my work box and never touched it. Yeah, yeah there's, there's usually not a drum tech emergency during the day that they're going to need you. No, so definitely. Yeah. The only reason I have one is because Cindy is a principal, so it's like they want to know about stuff of her going back to the dressing room and stuff with her and Carlos. But otherwise, I'm yeah. down with never having a radio ever. Yeah. What other what other roles or responsibilities do you have? Is there anything more than the drum set that sometimes gets added on to your list of things to do? Oh, t totally. Like what? Depends on the gig. I mean, towels, water, or drinks for all the other guys in the band, or set lists, set lists, or you know, backstage jam room gear you got to yeah. deal with. You know, or sometimes. I mean, I, I've done personal assisting on for Primus for a few years and, and not touching the gear on tour, just at the rehearsal room. And that, that's a whole nother world, man. I mean, Mike, you know, you, you say, or was it McGee? You were yeah. doing a lot of that with, with uh, Aerosmith and yeah. that's a whole nother world, you know, where you're not touching so much gear. You're just taking care of the needs of an artist. It's like, go to the bus, get my something. Yeah. Oh, you're, ba you're babysitting. Yeah, no, like, no like, not this one. The other one, you're like running out of the arena back and forth trying to get to the bus. It's like, I yep. just sit behind the drum set and make sure to look at it because I know it's going to kick butt tonight and not have to run around. For, you know? Yeah, you do. When uh, I mean, I've done the personal assistant thing. I did Steven Tyler in 2011. Wow. For like for six That's months. I, I had a full head of hair when I started. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a tough gig. And yeah, well, because basically it's, it's 24 seven. Yeah. And, and someone of his uh, fame, had a lot of stuff. We were doing American Idol. Yeah. You know, you're flying here. With the, the band was working on an album. So you're going all over the place, you know, and it takes a team to keep keep something like that going, you know. Yeah. You got management, five people in management, travel agents. Hairdressers. You know, yeah, the hair, makeup, and, and yeah. you're responsible for trying to keep everything running. And it's, God, there was two of us doing that. And it's still, you still can't keep up. Yeah. And, but doing Joey, you know, I, I've known Joey now so long being when I moved to kind of doing his road assistant stuff, it's, you know, I know what he likes and how he is. So you kind of pre preemptive strike, yeah. you know, on, on stuff, you know, you know well, and you get used to it, you know what to do knowing he's going to ask for it without him asking yet, you know? Yeah, exactly. And you carry a lot of stuff in your backpack. That's right. <laughs> Glo gloves and, and stick, uh, you know, tape, tape yeah. for his fingers, stick, wrap, whatever. Just yeah. anything that, that could, you know, be asked for. Yeah. I always had to carry a Sharpie in my pocket no matter what. Oh, yeah. That's, no a, that's a given. We went, somebody wants Les Claypool's autograph, you know, and I, it, it became a thing with me like to this day until COVID all my life of since I started roading, there's a Sharpie and a drum key in my pocket. Even when I'm not on tour, I just have to have that in there, you know, because that's like a, a dude, I feel my pocket. Okay, got my yeah. Okay, got my drum key. Okay, even though I don't need it, I got to make sure it's there. You know, it's like your wallet, you know? Yeah. That's See, I, I I tape the Sharpie to my uh, carabiner that carries my laminate. All right. Yeah, uh, I, so I have to keep it in my pocket because I, I don't like wearing lanyards because they catch on the drum set and stuff. So, and then with less, you know, in those days, uh, the autograph well, days when I was there, yeah. you just... I would have two Sharpies in my pocket sometimes because you just, man, sometimes you walk out the back door and there's 50 kids and Les would used to sign for every single one of them, you know? Oh, yeah. He doesn't do that much anymore. But back then, if you didn't have a Sharpie, it was big trouble, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Les would make you run to the bus and get a Sharpie and come back. You know, yeah, see? you. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> all the they're time. around. They're always like yeah. close at hand, you know. Yeah, become a, <laughs> where I'm a, at. A way of life. So what? So if you're in the, I'm with you. <laughs> that's if you're doing some live dates and some festivals. That's one thing. Some concerts. What's it like doing if you're in the studio where they're going to record, or if you're doing TV shows? Sometimes the TV shows you're using backline gear, right? So I mean, sometimes there's got to be some real adaptability here. It depends on on the band on how much yeah. they want to spend to get their gear around. You know. Yes, yeah, some bands will they'll have their backline no matter what. Yeah. Some right. Don't care at all, and you're playing literal garbage from some dude's basement and wherever and you know yeah that doesn't really fly you know i mean unless you're just a first your first hit band and your record label is in management is forcing you to fly everywhere you know for two weeks to play every tv show to pump that single that's that's cranking up the charts it, it's not cost effective to try to jet gear around for yeah. a band like that, that doesn't have the funds you know like but like with show crow or Roger Waters, we didn't do many, we only did one TV show, but Cheryl Crow did so many TV shows and there was, sometimes we'd have rental this or rental that. And one time the wrong guitar got brought, right? And she put her foot down and said, go get me. I'm not playing that guitar on this song. I want, so we stagehand dude lived up the street and had a Strat or something that she wanted to play. And it was like that night on the bus or on the plane to the next one, production manager said, okay, Cheryl just gave me the word, my gear everywhere, every single show. I don't care how much it costs. I don't want this to ever happen again. You got it, Cheryl. And so we flew up her gear, whatever yeah. minimum backline we needed. If it was one song, you brought for that one song. But if it was a show in Italy and you flew to Italy for one day and you flew back, all of her gear was going to do a show. There was yeah. no answer or thoughts about it. So it could be yeah. like They and earned it. And then yeah. sometimes, you know, you do, you know, you do the whole doing five TV shows in Manhattan and, you know, in, in three days or whatever. And yep. it's backline gear, but it's the same rental dudes providing right. their gear. The same all kid five from SIR or whatever. Yeah, they'll, exactly. they'll put that kid aside and it just that little package will go to all those shows. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that with, with bands as well. That works yeah. okay because you get that kit dialed in. And yeah, so and then it's you with you for the last and then you're yeah. on Letterman that night. It's the same kit, you know. You yeah, know, you exactly. Yeah. Well, talk about talk about touring, guys. You know, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of traveling in my life to ten, you know, fifteen countries a year, and, and the traveling is absolutely intense. But Mike, let's start talking about just what what's touring like for you when you're touring and you're hitting the road and you're in and out of hotel rooms, you're setting up back at the venue, come back, grab a bite to eat, go in. What's it like to be on being on the road? Oh, I love it. it. I guess I kind of don't know anything else. So, you know, I started touring, touring when I was 20. Before that, I worked in a theater. So um, I guess it's pretty normal. COVID's been pretty brutal in that sense. Like, I haven't been this home this long and ever since I was, I don't know, 17. So <laughs> touring is, I like it. I like seeing the new things. I, uh, I like I'm one of the dudes who still goes out on days off, you know, even if I've been to places tens of times, just because I like to walk around and check it out. Totally. You know, and there's definitely some yeah. people who are not that way that they've been there and they'll just stay in their room all day. And that's cool too. But that's just my personality is like, I go walk around and I'll go to the same places. Yeah. Time. I guess it depends too on a schedule. If you're, yeah. if you're with a band doing like seven, eight shows in a row, yeah, right. you get a, you get a so day off finally. <laughs> yeah, you're in the room chilling with a, some yeah. beer ice and not doing anything, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm one of the rare roadies. I don't drink. Oh, I, okay. never, I, I never did drugs, so I was never the bar type of guy either. Right, mm -hmm. I don't do the drugs. I just drink. I don't drink, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm, so. At the bar. Well, it was interesting. Uh, Roger Waters was, and then into Whitesnake was almost the same, where we had more days off than we had show days. Interesting. Like, when we did, you know, it's like there's three days off and then you do two shows and then there's two days off and then there's a show and then there's three days off. It's like that. I mean, it's it was a whole weird thing to adjust to, you know? Yeah. And when we went down to South America for the final leg of Roger Waters in 2018 or 19, whenever that was. Uh, dude, we, we it was a two month tour, two and a half months. Yes, yeah, two months and two weeks through South America and Mexico, and we did 22 shows. Incredible. 
Yeah, and that's mm-hmm. in South America and Mexico have the craziest fan bases that I have. Oh, found. we were doing guys, stadiums. It was yeah, because the show was an arena show. But when we got down there, nope, we had to do two nights at stadiums, and it was yeah. packed. With Jesus Belt, you know, it was crazy. Uh, most ele- electric crowds you've ever been around. Yeah. Right places you know it's it's really insane you know chilly yeah. are, are there specific areas on on the planet that you know that the audiences are are that much more electric yeah oh south america south america down, hands down the craziest stuff i've ever seen with yeah they chase followers. they would chase like like when i was work when i travel with the band like an aerosmith and you get picked up at the airport i mean these kids would They'd rent taxis and the taxis would be speeding alongside the vans, Man. you know, with signs they'd be hanging out of the car doing 80 miles an hour and yeah. police escorts. And it's pretty cool to be a part of, you know, but then you're thinking, man, I'd rather be at the hotel setting up a drum kit tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the kids that crowd around the hotels is really, yeah, to me too. You know, I mean, I've yeah. been around some of that and it's, it's a weird scene, you know, like where it you get show your room key through to get through the crowd of dudes waiting to get an autograph, you know. <laughs> and when they and when they when the crowd, yeah, the crowds will start singing a song in unison. You're yeah. talking hundreds and hundreds of, of kids outside a hotel. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's, well, well, to give you an idea, like we did some Primus shows down in, in Chile a few years ago. It was right before I started the Roger Waters thing. And it was a theater, you know, maybe 3,000, 4,000 people, you know, just kind of a theater gig, you know, great gig, you know, Primus is down there. It was all rental gear and they start playing songs. And I, I am not kidding. The crowd was singing the guitar melodies louder than the PA was cranking it out into the crowd. You could not hear the PA because they were singing what the guitar was playing. It was like, I'd never seen that before. I was like, wow, this is, yeah. man, these guys are bonkers for this stuff. Got to come here every six months, you know. <laughs> they always they, they always sing that uh, that soccer chant too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah that no, one. way, 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 way. <laughs> Brazil, yeah. man, that's yeah. going in the stadium. You got to plug your ears and get. Oh, something. that the soccer and football in Brazil area in those areas, it's yeah, huge. Yeah, they yeah. love the concerts, and the concerts are huge. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's kind of funny how you go to the polar opposite of that is when you go to Japan, you know, in the yeah. Old- and ever they just courteously, cur- very curtly sit there and watch the show, <laughs> and, they and then clap, and they clap, yeah, golf clap, and then the show ends, and then they all stand up and do the golf clap, and then they leave. <laughs> that's that's the ab- that, yeah, that absolute best place to do a gig is Japan. I I went uh, seven times, you know, in my first nine years of touring. Uh, yeah, but but I've been like Heisman since. I haven't been been over there since '05 now. Oh well, I've I've been there pretty quite, quite often. It's been fun. Yeah, it's been a lot different. We did back there. We did that uh, Fuji Fest a few years oh, ago yeah. before we started Roger, and it, I, I the crowd was bouncing. It was like I'd never seen that in Japan anywhere at any show yeah. at any time, and it was like wow, things have changed, man. Because artists used to not want to go there just because the crowd just stands there and watches or just sits and claps like this, you know. Like they don't get a vibe off the crowd. I remember Cheryl Crow and the band hated it, you know, like this sucks. They don't like us. They just sit there, you know, it's like, that's just how they are, man. They're not Brazilian, dude. They're not going crazy for a soccer chant in between every song, you know? Yeah. And where do they, where do they get off picking up their own trash too? <laughs> <laughs> and they, they just went the way they file out of yeah. Budokan, you know, like all yeah. sudden, the place is empty in like 10 minutes, you know, Most all polite the, people they, ever section goes out of it like in single file line it was so weird well what what great respect but talking about respect listen you guys are working with legends in this music industry you really really are and each of you probably has a book somewhere that you could write that could just talk about some of the stories and some of the anecdotes in a very healthy way to let people know what it's like to be you know the the spine behind the machine that's entertaining everybody how do you develop the trust with a lot of these legends you know (laughs) How do you develop the kind of confidence where they believe in you and can trust you? Because they're around people that, you know, you know, it's difficult to find that level of trust. Um, Mikey, you want to start this one? Yeah, I was going to say, in my experience, just do your gig and do it well. I mean, there's lots yeah. of things after that. But number one, like if you suck, you suck, you know, and <laughs> they're, they're not going to like you or, you know, they'll have a lot more reasons to not like you if uh, – you know, 
you're not good at your gig or you're too busy posing somewhere or whatever instead of doing your gig. So I feel like if you just do your gig, that's where you need to start. That needs to be your baseline. It's yeah. Like, you can do your gig well. I mean, Dom, the, the stuff just unfolds in front of you, whether you like it or not, you know, like things happen no matter what. A big, like what Mike's saying, you could sit there and hide behind the drum kit all day long, you know, and just try to not be a part of anything else that goes on other than your drum kit. But it just, it, no matter how hard you try. Yeah, it's never going to be that way. It happens and you're around something or you see something or yeah. suddenly there's drama. I mean, you just can't avoid it, man. It's, it's yeah. there's, there's no plot like that you read before you start in the instruction manual to start with a new band, you know, so you never right. know until you get there to see how it goes. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you were like Mike said, you work, if you, if you do your job and keep your drummer happy, I mean, that's, that's a hundred percent of the gig. Yep. And, and I've always found too, if I do screw up, which we all do, you got to own up to it. I mean, yeah, great it, shot right there. It, it, yeah. It, oh, thank you. Yeah. I didn't take it. No. <laughs> But that's uh, Peter. I became good friends with Peter on the Aerosmith Kiss tour. And he's actually the reason that I got into drums as a kid when I saw Kiss, you know, as a child. Uh huh. And that was, that's so it was pretty cool getting to meet him and watch him play every night. Wow. Yeah, great shots. Yeah. But about owning up to your mistakes, I found will usually silence the situation. And yeah. they just say, hey, try not to do it again, you know? Yeah, uh, that, that's the worst. It's you know something happens. I see it. You you see the guys around you, and it's like, oh, but this. Uh, just say like, yeah, I messed up. Sorry. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But you know, your your job is to make sure nothing messes up. You know, and doing this teching stuff for thirty plus years now, thirty three years, however long it's been. You know, in the old van club days you know everyone had janky gear and stuff broke all the time and you were diving on stage to fix stuff you know and you progress to these arena size bands and stadium size bands you know like we talked about earlier you don't want to go out there and try to fix something because the hundred people on the crew are going to call you out on it you know the next day like aha we saw you you messed up aha you know your symbol fell like you make sure that stuff does not happen and then <laughs> you have no issues with the artist coming at you or you did a bad job, you know, you just make sure your butt's covered and your, your stuff is bulletproof, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, that's why I, this, the Roger Waters gig, nothing. I, you weren't even allowed on stage. I had to go on stage. I was the only roadie allowed on stage during the gig. Cause Joey, we had six snare drums with different tunings for different eras of Pink Floyd or different song stylings. So I was allowed to sneak up there and swap snares with them real quick, but, Roger Waters was like, nothing, no roadies go on stage, no guitar handoffs. All the guitars were on stands on the stage, you know, like you couldn't go up there until the band was gone, except for me. I could sneak up and get in and out, you know? Yeah. It brings me to another really funny story. When we did Oysterhead, uh, the guitar tech was Brian Brown. Funny, funny, funny dude from LA. Older dude. And he was Trey Anastasio's tech, right? For fish as well. And so Trey had this like big, uh, Persian carpet with like five different sections of pedal board stuff, right? And all this brack and all this stuff and all these instruments. And we and I was like, man, I, you guys don't ever go on stage during the show and all the guitar. What's going on with that? And he would have duplicates of each section of pedal board. And all day he'd be knocking on pedals and he had this tone generator that he'd knock on pedals. And I go, dude, what happens if something goes wrong during the show? Like, what what if the pedal breaks on that that dude right there? And he'd said. It's not allowed. <laughs> what if? He goes, well, you know, I went to Trey about that in the beginning. And I said to Trey, I said, you know, Trey, what if this breaks? He goes, well, no, your job is to make sure that it does not break. He goes, well, what if it breaks? He goes, you're saying like, you want me to time travel into the future? See that that pedal is going to break, come back from the future and <laughs> they'll swap that pedal out before the show. And he said, Trey looked him in the eye and said, exactly. Learn how to do that. <laughs> so he would just change pedal boards out randomly all day long you know every show yeah. just to hear that nothing because he was not allowed on stage you know during the show boy what great what just uh, this is just this great insight let me in, in just a few minutes we have left what is it like depending on a company like vader where when you need something they're there for you what's that like it's the best yeah i mean Bra oh. i've been dealing with brando a long time uh yeah. 
I've worked for quite a few Vader drummers just out of the blue, you know, and, and being so close to Vader, you know, I've, I've gone to the shop and picked stuff up and left the next day with it on tour. So I saved him a few bucks shipping, but, but when <laughs> anything, anything you ever needed with Chad, you know, with a Vader artist, he's always right on top of things. And that's why he's, he's the best at what he does. And Vader, yeah. Vader is like a mom and pop work at his, uh, company, you know, they're not so corporate, you know, and you really get that mom and pop feeling with Vader. And, you know, I, I went to the factory one time and got to meet Alan was super awesome. And I met, uh, his brother who passed away last year. Ron. Yeah, Ronnie. Yeah. Those guys, Ron was down there grinding sticks and Alan was tapping sticks out, you know, it, yeah. it's a really cool scene to have a company that's, that's, you know, that relied on and they, they come through every time, you know, anytime you need anything and you call Chad, the box shows up, man, it's great. You know, there's no delays. There's no, Oh, well, other bands are in front of you. You can't get that till next month. You know, I don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. And uh just like McGee was saying, I've been the majority of my long term gigs have been all Vader artists just by happenstance. So yeah. my relationship with Chad I feel like is pretty good. But and just Cindy Blackman Santana, she just switched to Vader. So yeah. all right. even better. I used to play her stick when she was on Zildjian because the drummer for Beck at the time on the Midnight Vultures used the Cindy Blackman stick. And he would go through eight pairs a night because he didn't want a stick to break. He was so nervous. <laughs> he would just keep dropping them and say, just give me new ones, give me new ones. And I, I took home bundles of Cindy Blackman sticks and played them for years until they were gone, you know? Yeah. Well, that was a great stick. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then she was on Vic Firth for a while, so that's who. Okay. Zildjian doesn't do the signature models anymore. I know Correct. that. Yeah. Well, with what Vader's doing, they're making an incredible quality product. They are yeah. Yeah. the support. You mentioned Chad Brandolini, who was the artist relations. He is just an absolute top pro to support the artists and support techs like you guys for what you need because you know you're out there, you're promoting the business, you're making this whole thing go by. You guys really are the backbone for these shows. I must say. Thank you so much. You guys have done absolutely great. This has been extremely interesting and eye-opening. Many of the comments that we have here are just people, you know, in awe of the fact that how you guys have developed such great trust and the fact that you've been doing it for this long, that says everything. Yep. You guys have really been doing this for a long time, which means you have earned, you've earned that respect, you've earned the trust, and you've earned that long business relationship that they know that when they call you, it's going to be done right. You guys have done well. Oh, thank you, Dom. Thank you. Really fantastic. On behalf of Vader, we thank you so much for your time, guys. Tim Sawyer, thank you so much. Anytime. Mike, I'll do it anytime you guys want. I'll come back whenever. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Mike, you did, you did <laughs> great. And McGee, thank you so much, man. You guys are absolutely thank you. Season you. pros for sure. Thank you, Dom. <laughs> thank you so much and stay well, man. Fantastic, guys. These guys are really the backbone, as I said, putting on these shows and making it happen and what they go through the intensity of of all of this to have the gear the planning out these guys are engineers they are mechanics they're construction guys these guys have it all together at so many levels to keep this all going so i thank you all so much for your time today vader we do this on tuesdays at two o'clock boy we have had such a wide variety of people that we have each week is a different experience we've got some great great people that have joined us on the show here thank you so much spread the word tuesday Two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Come on by. We'll have some more fun people here. I thank you so much. Stay well on behalf of Vader. We thank you all, guys. Stay well and stay tuned.